I think uh, so. We can wait another just a couple seconds. Uh, if you, when you're entering, you know, I think you should be muted. If not, if you can mute uh, your lines, except for probably myself and Dr. Johnson here. And I'll let Nicole, if Nicole has anything to say initially, or do you want Nicole, first of all, is there anything housekeeping first? Or do you want me to just go ahead and introduce? Muted. You're muted. Yep, sorry about that. It's a little different when I'm sharing my screen. All right, so when you, you guys are here, here's a little slide for you. Make sure that you're logging in if you haven't changed your name already. Uh, make sure that you're logging into the Zoom with your first and last name just so we can take a look. If you want to ask a question, I'm sure Dr. Johnson will be stopping periodically to see if y'all have questions, but feel free to utilize the chat or you can unmute yourself um, and ask the question. The webinar is being recorded, so we do have that. And then at the end, we'll walk through um, going through the survey. So there is an FTI survey associated with the course. So we'll go through that um, at, the end of, at the end of today's class. So there we have it. And Tom, back over to you. Thanks, Nicole. And I, I want to uh, thank everybody for joining us uh, today. So uh, we're, we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Mark Johnson here. Um, he is someone that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, you guys have, might have seen him uh, at, at the International Foundation. He's, he, I know I, I've seen his presentations there um, times. Um, in addition, um, him and I, in fact, at the last um, apprenticeship, uh, it was online, but him and I did a, 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 a presentation together. Um, and with after that, in talking with him, you know, I wanted to make sure that we are staying afloat of, of some of these best practices in, in virtual instruction um, and having that conversation with Dr. Johnson, you know, seeing what some of the things that you as instructors need or, or your instructors need. Uh, early on in the, when this thing went uh, virtual and, and you know, a lot of our training centers shut down, uh, you know, we did, some, we did those workshops in Zoom and, and we worked on some of the technology and, and getting used to, to that and that new delivery method, which, which was important. And we've continued to give you, you all resources on that. Um, so hopefully you have found those useful. But at the same time, um, you know, now that most of you are probably, most of us are pretty familiar with, with, with these technologies, now it's really to look at the, the teaching, the instruction, and the learning that's taking place on the, on the backside. So in talking with Dr. Johnson, um, we came up with, uh, this is one in a series of three workshops that he will do for us. This first one is going to be, uh, I'll let him talk more obviously about it, but understanding today's learner. Um, which is a little bit different than maybe some of us when we were in school, depending on our age, um, but also just the changing, you know, you know, landscape of how learning is taking place. And then he will look at in, in two and three, they'll be looking at more advanced topics. I uh, you know looking at engaging the learner. They'll also be t t discussing um, assessments, you know, hands-on assessments in the virtual world. Uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, you know, he's a very, very much a friend of labor, not just working with the International Foundation. I'll let him share his little bit more of a background, but I know he does the, like for the lack of better term, teaching techniques like for the IATSE group as well. So he's, he's, he's their main uh, instructor uh, for them as well. So, so I want to again, thank you for, for, for your time. Again, as Nicole mentioned, if you got a question, you know, raise your hand, throw it in the chat. Uh, I'm sure, you know, having been on Dr. Johnson's uh, presentations before, he'll, he'll, he'll give plenty of time for let you guys be in, ask questions or get engaged into today's content. So with that, thanks again. And I will turn it over to you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me and glad to be with you folks today. It's a great opportunity to share some of my experiences. Just real quickly, let you know, I'm a university professor. I've been teaching 36 years and I started and spent the first 15 years of my life certifying the vocational instructors in the state of Kansas, where they taught bricklaying, carpentry, printing, auto mechanics, nursing, whatever. They took my methodology classes. Last 15 years, I've been more on the corporate side of things because helping companies, organizations, apprenticeship groups understand the idea of teaching people to do their work and maybe coming up with some ways to rethink that and do that better than what we've been doing. And so, as Tom mentioned, I've had the fortunate opportunity. I actually came to the FBI 
it's been about six years ago, came out and found 2015 or so, came out and did a presentation with training directors, coordinators there in Andover. Uh, but mostly I've been working with the International Alliance of Stage, Theatrical and Motion Picture Employees, IOTC, uh, and have done workshops for them all over the United States and Canada, probably trained about a thousand of their trainers on teaching techniques and how to improve the teaching process. So I had a great opportunity to work with Waver. One thing you might want to know, you might think I'm a university professor. What does he know about Waver? I'm at the only university in Kansas that actually has an organized teachers union. I was president then of that union for two years and the chief spokesperson for the bargaining team for five years. So I'm very connected with unions and providing a voice for the those that have no voice. And so uh, I'm very connected with that in doing that. And so uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's get kick things off. Nicole, since you've got control of my screen, the first slide here, and I actually took this slide from Tom. This was part of his slide in our presentation at the IFEB just a couple of weeks ago. But I thought it was a poignant one that talked about technology won't replace instructors and apprentices. And instructors and apprentices who use technology will replace those that do not. And that's going to be a component of what we talked about today, because we're living in the 21st century and it's moving pretty quick and we have to keep up with it. And if we're not, you can be guaranteed that our students are keeping up with it. They're what's now considered digital natives. They live and breathe it. And if we don't understand it, we're not even in their neighborhood. So just something to think about as we go through today. Next slide there, uh, Nicole. Okay, so let's first of all talk about probably the two primary sets of learners that we have in our classrooms today. Uh, the millennials, uh, which were the group from 1980 to 1994, and I have three of those in my family. My three sons are all millennials. The things about the millennials to understand were they were what were considered our digital pioneers. One of the reasons for that, if you stop and think about that, the internet really didn't happen for most of us, uh, World Wide Web until about the mid 1990s. And also computers, desktop computers, et cetera, that's when they came out was 1980s. I know I started teaching at the university in 1985. I didn't get my first computer in my room until 1989. And it was a Macintosh SE20, a whopping 20 megabyte hard drive. Woohoo! I was in big cotton, right? So I really thought I was on top of the world. But the thing was, our kids, the, the group that grew up in that time frame, as this technology was emerging, they were trying it out. They were using it. They were developing it. And so they became the digital pioneers. The other thing about millennials is they're a lot about work and life balance. Now, if you're like me, I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1960, so I'm one of the last of the baby boomers. But our generation was all about work and work ethic. You go to work. You work hard, you provide for your family, like many of you in the labor unions, and you got a strong work ethic. You're the guys and gals that build America. You're the ones that put that work effort. And so most of us, probably 70 to 80% of our time is spent thinking about work and how to improve work and what to do at work and how, how to continue to do work and provide for our family. Well, today's generation is a little less about just the work, but about my life, about my family, about those around me and spending quality time and, and doing things not just at the workplace. And so really a concerted effort to get more involved with the family and be, be there when the kids are growing up. I know my three sons that are millennials when they were younger, I was spending most of my time working and training. I taught distance learning. At that time, distance learning was putting your butt in the car and driving to wherever you were going. So I spent a lot of my time on the road going to teach people how to do stuff. So I was away from home a lot. Today's generation, yeah, they want to be there. They want to be with a family most of the time. So work-life balance. Also collaborative. Uh, we were more industrious than the baby boomers. Get her done. 
give us a job, let's go to it, get her done. And and a lot of times we were independent. We wanted to do the work. We wanted to make sure it was done. But the millennials are about collaboration, working with each other, exchanging ideas, talking about it, talking it through. And also seeking feedback, seeking feedback. You know, maybe some of us baby boomers didn't want that feedback so much. Just get out of the way, let me do it, and let's go do it. Feedback, though, for millennials is critical in helping them know how they're doing. It's part of that collaborative process and networking process, and they want to, want to do that. So the millennials started teaching us to think a little bit differently about how uh, we go by teaching them. So next one, uh, Nicole, next slide. So now we have today's generation, Generation Z. I don't know that we've, notice it says 2015. I don't know that we've identified the next generation, F Generation Z. They're my grandson. He's only five years old. So we haven't really identified their traits yet. But for Generation Z folks, this is the new young people, the 18, 24-year-olds are coming out, going to work right now. A lot of the folks that are just now thinking about entering the trades and becoming an apprentice, going to work, going to college, going wherever, this is that mindset, that group that most that we predominantly work with. At the university, most of our students, probably 60, 70% of our students are in this category. Now, mind you, I teach workforce development. Most of my students are your age group. I have them all ages from 30 to 50 to 60 years old. They've been out there working, got real life experiences, and they're making some changes and getting a degree. So I teach adult learners, and most of them have work experience. Most of them understand that. So my group's a little older for the most part, but the university, for overall, this is the group that we talk to on a daily basis. Generation C. Now, notice that we talked about the millennials being the, the digital pioneers, because when technology was just emerging, they were the ones trying it out. It was just coming out. They were working with it, doing it. They still worked with um, a floppy disk, uh, three and a half disk. They still worked with, you know, Oregon Trail. You pop the disk in the computer or they even worked with CD-ROM and the games, and we would put the CD-ROMs into the computer and work and learn on it. Or even learning in elementary games, you could pop in a CD-ROM, you pop it in. Well, Gen Z are digital natives. We're way past that. Everything is on the internet. Everything is accessible on Google, uh, uh, Yahoo, whatever. They're able to go out and get it. And this group has never not known what having computers and cell phones uh, are like. They have no idea what that's about. When I talked to them about when I was growing up, uh, we lived in the country and our phone was a landline and it was a party line. How many of you remember party lines? Party line was the neighborhood. Everybody in the community, the phone rang. And depending if it rang once, twice, three times, four times, how many of times that was your ring? Well, if it rang four times, you picked it up. Didn't mean you were the only one picked it up because the neighbors, that's how they learned to gossip was to pick up listen in on the conversation. That was the party line. <laughs> so kids have no concept of what that was like, right? They are used to cell phones and texting and everything right now. And so they're the digital natives. They live and breathe technology. Uh, it's almost connected to the hip. And I think some of us that are baby boobers sometimes get a little frustrated with them sometimes because they spend so much time with the technology. And we're going to address that in just a minute on, a, on another issue about how to engage them and, and work with these young people. This group is also about equality and diversity. Uh, they're all about uh, taking care of others, taking care of other people, meeting the needs of others, and, and providing an equal opportunity for everybody. This group, instead of being collaborative, though, tends to be a little bit more competitive and independent. Because everything is digital and it's right there, they have immediate access on Google or whatever they need, 
they can be pretty independent, do their own thing. Uh, they don't have to have mom or dad give them instructions. Heck, I'll just look it up on Google and tell me what to do. Or I need to know how to do something, I'll pull up Facebook and it will show me what to do. So they're pretty independent about doing their work and getting their information. And they like to consider themselves multitaskers. The fact that they do lots of little projects all going on at the same time. Now, the reality we know as teachers, people don't learn multiple things at one time. Uh, in our industry, we scaffold. We teach them a basic concept, we scaffold an idea, the next thing, and we teach that next component. And so we're all about teaching one thing at a time so people get it before we build on it. Well, they like to take those little nuggets and run with each one of them simultaneously. So they're not getting all of it done at one time. They're spending a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and then go back. And they've got multiple things going, but they love to multitask. But that's the group that we're working with and dealing with that you're seeing coming in to your trades at this point. Next slide, Nicole. And the LinkedIn, how many of you are on LinkedIn, by the way? Are you all connected on LinkedIn? I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I've been able to, uh, as, and if maybe some of you are connected with me already, I've got about 17,000 followers on there. Uh, but I find it very useful. I learn a lot on LinkedIn. And there's a lot of good information, some bad, but a lot of good concepts and conversations there. My students use it a lot for referencing and recommendations and stuff. Way for me to network with people like Tom and others across the industry. They did a report just last two years ago, uh, and they came up with several things. And one of the key things that I picked up on their learning report is this whole idea about knowing our learner. Our learners want to be engaged, and by engaged. That doesn't mean them sitting and listening to me. That's low level engagement. That's almost non-engagement. Because quite frankly, if you stop and think about the term engagement, engagement means two-way, both of us involved. So right now, I'm feeling more perplexed because I'm talking to a group of 20 of you, and I'm the only one talking. There's not been any engagement for us. So engagement is us getting into a conversation. So real quick, I want to see uh, from a few of you, I want to hear from some of you. It says, know your learner, boost engagement. So I want to know who's in the room. So if we could kind of go through one by one, tell me who you are, how long you've been teaching in the trade or what your role is and, and what you're doing. So if you could just do that real quick. Go through each other and pop up. Tell me what you do, how long you've been doing. Go ahead. I am uh, Mike Kamarmi. I'm the director of training for District Council 11. Uh, I've been a Glazer for 41 years next month. Wow. And uh, I've been the training director for 15 years. Fantastic. Good job. Whoever's next. I guess this is a free for all. So my name is uh, Wayne Daigle. I'm also with District Council 11 up here in Connecticut. Uh, I've been in the trade since 1982, but I'm not very good at math. I'll let you guys figure that out. And um, I've been an instructor here since uh, 2002. So I've been an instructor 18 years full time for the last 12 as a glazer. I en enjoy it very much. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Next. Yes, uh, my name is Veronica Leo. I'm from DC 14, Chicago. Um, I've been in the union for 27 years total. I've been instructing here at the um, apprenticeship school for four years, and I specialize in wall coverings. Excellent. Next. Juan Bernal, I'm with District Council 9. Um, been in the business uh, 23 years in the union and uh, been an apprenticeship coordinator here for 16 years. Excellent. Thank you, Juan. 
Frankie Jones, uh, DC 77 out of Atlanta. I'm a glazer, uh, been in the trade 22 years, uh, full-time instructor for seven, part-time three years before that. Okay, thank you. I'm Lisa yeah. Brooks. I'm also out of DC 77 in Atlanta. I'm an industrial painter. I've been um, in the union since 2014, started as an apprentice, and I've been a part-time instruction instructor for um, about a year and a half. Thank you very much. Next. Uh, Matt Shepard, District Council 14 out of Chicago. I'm a commercial painter by trade. Uh, been in the trade 21 years. Uh, been teaching in Chicago for two and a half at the apprenticeship. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Next. We go from um, home. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. John Plimpton, District Council 11. I've been an industrial painter for 28 years, um, training for five years, and coordinating uh, for three. Okay, John, thanks. Thanks. I'm Steve Metzger, DC 21. Um, been a blazer since 2006. Uh, started instructing in 2014. And I um, have been on staff here for three years. Uh, Thanks. Full time. Thanks. Appreciate it. Next. Um, Dan Penske Jr., DC 14, Chicago, director of training. Um, been the director for the last year and a half here in Chicago. Prior to that, my old boss is on, on the call here. Um, I used to work for the FTI for the past six years. Very good, excellent. Next. Dan McDonald out of DC 46. Been instructing for the last four to five years, almost five years, I guess. Uh, industrial paint since about 2000. Very good, thank you. Joe Tarkowski. 14 industrial uh, instructor been in the trade for 24 years instructor here uh, for six years now um, specialize again in industrial with steel painting sand blast things like that okay thanks joe jesse kamarmi i'm with district council 11. i have been working with the union for about eight or nine years now um, I'm not actually a trainer, but I do all the behind the scenes stuff. So I'm here to hopefully um, receive some information that I can share with our students. And appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it was Jesse? Yes. Yep. Thanks, Jesse. Next. My name is Antonella DeCaro. I'm the Director of Training for FTI Ontario with District Council 46. Just actually started off in the role back in November. Um, I've been in the construction industry, but never in the actual field, more on the administrative side. Thank you, and I apologize. That's my phone ringing on the other side of the room. I apologize. Next. And it's not a cell phone, so I can't shut it off. <laughs> Sorry. Next. Mike Moreshi out of DC 35, Boston, local 1280. Uh, this month is the 41st anniversary of being sworn into local 1280. So our meeting is tonight. So I'm going to take today as my anniversary date. Uh, I spent 33 years in the field as a drywall finisher. Uh, began in, as an instructor with the uh, um, FTI New England in 2008 and secured a full-time position in 2013. Excellent. Congratulations on your anniversary. 
Great Thank job. You. Thank you, sir. Next. Uh, Tim Yost, DC 35 Boston. I've been an industrial painter for 22 years now and uh, a trainer for the last seven. Thank you, Tim. Got a few more of you. I'm Alex. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mike, if you were talking, you were muted. Oh, so I, okay. I've been a glazer for 31 years. I've um, been training at DC 46 or FTI Ontario for the last seven as a full time glazing instructor. Before that, I was a part time instructor. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Next. Stuart McGovern, FTI Ontario, District Council 46, for the painting instructor, FTI Ontario, for 18 years now. Really believe in this online learning. It's the way we're going, whether we want to or not. Glad to have you here, Stuart. Thank you. Next. Yeah, Rob Zappa here, DC 14, Chicago, commercial painting instructor. Okay, Robert, thank you. We're getting through most of you. I think we just got a couple more. Go ahead. Anybody that we've not heard from? I'm Alan Speck. I'm out of DC 77. I've been painting about 18 years, instructing about four now. Okay, thank you. Dan, have we heard from you yet? Dan or Ronald? Well, okay. We'll take my moment of silence. Go ahead. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, if we were in live doing this in person, uh, I would, and if I had control of my slides, I'd be going out so I could see all of you at the same time, so I could see and connect the faces and, and the interactions. Uh, and as some of you may have seen me, uh, I do pretty good at making connections and memorizing names when I can see you. But because of slides, I'm only getting to see five of you at a time, so I'm going to have to adjust to see that. One of those digital things I've got to get used to as I go through this presentation is a uh, thing I struggle with sometimes is some of you got your screens on, some of them got it off. There's reasons for that. I understand that. I'm used to the audience being there right there in front of me. But in this digital age, not always the case. So we just got to get used to some of those things. So thank you for sharing the information. We got a lot of wealth of knowledge in a room. You're not necessarily newbies at this. So I'm not necessarily teaching you anything. You maybe don't already know, but I'm definitely maybe going to share some things that you haven't considered or thought about. So let's talk about that. We'll move ahead to the next slide, Nicole. So the question is, so we got this information on our new learners, the millennials and the Gen Zs. So the question is, what do we do with that information? What does that mean that we need to do differently as we move forward with this? So go to the next slide, please. Well, one of the things is, is as we're using technology is keep it simple. That's the big lesson from here. Keep it simple. Break it down. If you remember, um, one of the things that we've learned about uh, our audience is, uh, go to the next slide. I think it's the next slide, Nicole. They are in the age of micro learning. You know, so as I told you before, I've been teaching for a long time, 36 years. And I've been teaching online for a long time. I've been doing distance learning since I started 36 years ago. 
36 years ago, distance learning for me was getting in a car and driving somewhere to go teach people. In the 1990s, uh, late 80s and early 90s, we had a thing in Kansas, we called it interactive distance learning. Now, in your parts of the country, they may have called it something different. It was on talk television. Did any of you ever do that before talk television? So talk television is just like we're doing with Zoom here, except we had a room and we had four television sets at the top of the uh, dry board or chalkboard. And we had four TV sets and we had classroom cameras in four different locations. And so I would be in a room with a group, some students there with me, but then in each of the four locations, were different sites. Uh, so from Pittsburgh, Kansas, south of Kansas City, I would be speaking to Wichita, Salina, uh, Topeka, and Kansas City. And those students in those rooms would see me on TV. I could see them on TV. And we would talk just like we're doing now. But instead of an individual camera, it was an entire classroom. And so I did that for a while. Then we went to the Internet. And we started posting things on Blackboard, on Angel. I even went through a period called Black Angel, where they took over each other. And now we're on a thing called Canvas. And it's a learning management system, much like I understand Tom shared Persona, I believe, is the one that you use. And it's a learning management system that kind of hosts and controls all your lessons, your videos, your learning activities, and that sort of thing. And we've been doing that for probably about 15 years here at Pittsburgh State University. But I'll tell you what, I thought I had it made because I've been teaching for such a long time and getting used to my subjects, other than a few tweaks and updates on the information in my classes, I was pretty well set. I had my 15 or I had all my classes condensed to 15 or 20 minute videos that students could go on, watch the videos, then do the assignments, the activities, and the related engagement things after the fact, after my 20-minute video. I'm set. I'm good to go. And then a couple of years ago, reality hit me. They're not watching my dumb videos because they don't watch 20-minute videos. Think about it. How many of you might have watched a video on your cell phone? You've been going through your Facebook or YouTube and you see a video pops up and, oh, that's cool. And you look at the time, how many of you, think about this. It was a 20 minute video actually hit play when it said 20 minutes. Nobody, we don't eat, baby boomers don't even watch 20 minute videos in the middle of our day because it takes too much time. And so the idea was micro learning. They do it in bits and chunks. And so I thought about that. What can I do to engage today's learners? Because I can't force them to watch the dumb video, right? It's kind of like we used to say about reading the textbook. So how do we get them to get the information? So I thought, okay, I'll change it up. So I had a class that had 15 lessons and it was a 15 week class, 15 lesson lectures that were 20 minutes each. I turned those 15 to 20 minute videos into seven or eight two minute videos. So now I have 80 videos instead of 15. So each lesson they go through and they see a video, a couple of minutes, then an activity a video and an activity, a video. So what I was essentially doing was taking my lectures, but I was breaking the topics or the subcomponents of each lesson into its own lesson, a bite-sized chunk. And then would have self-check quizzes, learning activities and assignments, would make them do things. So for example, for example, in your trades uh, with IOTSE, uh, the riggers teach us how to tie bowlins and knots. So if I'm teaching how to tie a knot, then instead of teaching them all the knots, we work on one at a time and we break it down into a simple two or three minute video. 
and then we would have them post their video and watch them do the knot along with me. And so I broke it down. And so I was talking to some of my students. I said, so what do you think about the new video? Oh, I love it. Because I can be at work during the day and I got a 10 minute break. I can pop on and I can watch one or two of those videos on my 10 minute break. And I come back in the afternoon, watch some more. By the end of the day, I've watched the whole lesson. But I never had 20 minutes during the day to ever do that before. Now I can't. And so they liked the idea that I was changing my strategy up to fit their personal style and needs. And from one aspect of it, it's a pride thing. Those of us have been teaching for a long time. We're pretty good at what we do. We've been doing it while we like what we do. But then all of a sudden to decide that, well, wait a minute, I got to change things. That's a humbling thing sometimes. But if we're going to meet the needs of today's learner and we're going to encourage young people to join the trades and come in and join us, we kind of meet, got to meet them halfway and teach them in ways and uses that they understand. So one of this concepts, one of the first concepts that I learned in this whole scenario is to keep it simple. Break it down into subparts. Have any of you ever um, saw my presentation that I presented at IFED? Matter of fact, it was the first one I gave in 2014. And it was a way how people learn. And I talked a little bit about this idea of the latency concept. Any of you haven't seen that? Let me share a little bit with you about what that means. So in the construction, in the trades industry, in the apprenticeship industry, we've been doing this for a long time. we got a pretty good system of teaching people and putting them to work. Very good thing to be proud of. In a career technical education, same thing. You know, in all public education, we put more people to work directly from our craft trades than any other form of education uh, in the country. Watch more than liberal education. I teach in the college technology at the university, and we have 80 to 90 percent placement of our graduates going directly into their industry for what they were being trained to do. So we're pretty proud of it. But along the way, I asked this question What about the other 20 to 30 percent? You know, a lot of times in education, we come up with a lot of excuses. Well, they learn differently than I teach. They have different learning preferences. They have different learning challenges. And while that's all and good, the responsibility of the instructor in the classroom is to take whoever comes in the room and to help them to learn what it is they're teaching. To rethink, re-strategize, re-come up with different ways of doing it. And the reason is that they're not getting it isn't always their fault. I tell my students, it's not a slow student, slow teacher. Because if 30% of my students aren't getting it, I might be part of the problem. And I got to thinking about that. And there's an issue that's covered latency. Now, latency was talked about, Freud talked about it in the 1920s. And Tolman, in 1932, wrote about it. He did a thing with rats in a maze. Put them in a maze. He put cheese at the end of it. And if there was cheese at the end of it, they ran right on through, skedaddled through, and went straight to the cheese. But if there wasn't any cheese there, they just kind of meandered around, took their time. And what he hypothesized is that people that aren't motivated to directly use what they've learned don't retain that information. So latency can be defined as when we deliver information and when it is applied. So for example, for most of you in the training industry that are teaching people a craft, that's the moment that you teach them the lesson and they're able to apply it on the job. They do it. They do what you just taught. Okay. But I noticed something 
in the way we do that. We have built latency into the way we teach. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of instructors will say, okay, I'm going to show you how to do this, folks. Everybody pay attention. Now, I don't want you to get confused, so don't do it. Just sit and watch me. And when I get through, then I'm going to let you do it. So here we go. Ready? And then we do it. And as soon as that five or 10 minute presentation is over, then we say, okay, now let's go to the lab. And we walk down. So we've done this in this pristine lecture hall with PowerPoints and desks and chairs. And we say, okay, let's go to the lab. Let's go do it. It takes five to 10 minutes to get into the lab and get everybody situated before they start. And all of a sudden, we realize that not everybody's able to do what we just showed them to do in the lecture room. Well, the problem isn't them, it's the fact that we allow this time between learning and application called latency. And I demonstrate that uh, in a YouTube video, by the way, if you ever want to watch it, Dr. John, Mark Johnson, Generation Y, and you can see it at TEDx video that I presented. And I demonstrate it with three techniques. I do a sailboat, in which I just talk people through, and only 10% are able to comprehend it. Then I do one with a paper airplane, and I have people fold a paper airplane, but I do the airplane, then I hand out the paper, and then they fold it, and only about 70% can get it. But then I do it a third way, and then that third way is I present it step by step, I show a step, they do the step, I check, I correct before we move to step two. And when we get to step six, everybody in the room is on the same page. A hundred percent performance at the end of that presentation. And I get a hundred percent participation and performance. And so by instead of doing Miller's technique linearly, step after step, pre prepare, present, apply, and evaluate. We do it simultaneously, and everybody gets it. So here's the notion I want you to think about with your teaching method. You're doing a great job teaching, but if you're not getting 100% of your students to do what you want them to do the first time you teach it, maybe you want to think about simplifying and doing a little bit of micro learning and have them do one step at a time, guarantee it's right, before they move to the next step. Just think about it. If we go through and they struggle the first time and they develop bad habits, how hard is it to get rid of a bad habit? Sometimes impossible. Takes a while. So what if we got rid of the bad habits in the beginning and we had them do it right the first time? I want to hear some thoughts and notions. I want to get some engagement going. Any ideas on this idea of micro learning? Talk to me. Anybody want to share? I think that. Um a lot of what we instruct, um, at least trade-wise, is, is easily broken up because uh, um, it's, it's already in a, in a step phase of step one, step two, step three. So maybe it's just a matter of, you know, prep work being broken apart from, from all the different things, stuff like that. So I think it's <clears throat> that idea tailors to what we teach. Absolutely. I agree with you because that's how we've been teaching people all along. But unfortunately for a lot of us, we do the step-by-step -step thing, but we do it as a whole process instead of teaching each step individually and assuring uh, compliance or performance with that step before going to the second step. Because if we do that, then we're all on the same bus. My analogy is a teacher that says, 
we're going to take a field trip. Everybody get on the bus. And they do, and they drive to where they're going. And then when they get there, the teacher turns around and says, wait a minute. They're not all here. Where did they go? Well, Johnny didn't get on the bus. He didn't even get there in the first place. Susie, she got off at the bathroom. Billy, he got off at McDonald's along the way. They're still waiting on their burger. And we got all the way to Kansas City before she turned around to notice not everybody's there. And so guess what the teacher has to do? You got to turn the bus around and go back and pick them up wherever they got off. And they do the repeat trip. Now, be honest with me, ladies and gentlemen. How many of you or have seen somebody that has gotten to the end of the lesson? Not everybody got it. And they backed the bus up. And because somebody said, uh, back on step number two. And they backed the bus up, go always step number two and reteach the whole lesson to the whole group, even though 70% of them already made the trip. And some of them will do that two or three times. Because they're thinking, well, some of the students didn't get it. I got to do it again. Well, what if we only did the bus trip one time, but we just went slower and made sure everybody was on the bus every leg of the journey? So, I think that will be um, easy depending what you're teaching. Um, for example, um, I do different types of classes. I do the walk rings and I do the fall finishes. So when I do the fall finishes, I can get exactly what you're doing and what you're telling us to do. Because I would do the step one step, I would show them what to do, and then everybody has to do the step. And then we have to wait for that to dry so we can continue with the next step. So, I mean, that makes it so easy and everybody's moving at the same page. But when I'm doing the wall covering classes, for example, there's some uh, apprentices that have experience already and they actually do it at work. So, if I keep it so slow that everybody's moving at the same page, I'm gonna be losing the ones that can, that, that have the ability and they're done it already. They're gonna get bored. They're gonna be causing issues or they're just gonna be like, okay, come on, speed it up. This is getting boring. So, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but sometimes depending what you're teaching, uh, you cannot just wait for everybody to move at the same page because you're going to be losing the ones that are ahead. That's my opinion. And Ronick, you bring up a good point because in technical training, we have always struggled with that. Our learners are different. We know that. Some come in with no experience and some come in with a lot of experience. And the question always has been, how do I teach a class when I got that full range in a classroom? Because we're afraid we're going to bore some and be over the head of others. So how do we find that mediocrity, that media? Well, here's the notion. Everybody in my classroom learns, but maybe not the same thing at the same time. Because if I've got a learner that already has mastered it and they're quick, and I get several that do that, but then I've got some that are struggling. So what I'll do is, is I'll do parent chair and I'll do coaching. And I'll say, for example, when I was in, uh, when I was in California that first time for the IFEB that I did my presentation, I did a six step process on making a paper cup, okay? I had 400 people in the room. There's no way I could get around all 400 people in the room. I was doing it up on stage. They were all doing it. And I could tell some people were struggling and others were not. So what I did was, you know, I can't get out to you. So I'll tell you what. So I'm going to do the step and you do it with me. And then match your cup to mine. And if it matches mine, you're good to go. But I want you to do me a favor. Look at your neighbor. And if your neighbor's struggling, once you've got your cup done, see if you can help your neighbor. 
Because what happens in, and think about it in your industry if you don't do this, the quick learners, the one that's already got it, they become the ones that you start thinking about moving up as crew chiefs, team leaders, because they got it, they're quick learners. And if we give them the chance to coach and teach during the lesson, so they're learning coaching skills while the other person just learning how to make the paper cup. Okay, they're both learning, but they're learning different things at the same time. And so the way to challenge the advanced learner is not repetitive work or different work. It is helping them advance their skills in what they're doing. Uh, we had a local manufacturer here, uh, Cessna Aircraft, the largest uh, manufacturer of, of small airplanes in the world right here in Kansas. And in Cessna, they had a system, their matrix system for workers that got promotions and pay raises on a three-point grid. One was the skill that they did. And for each additional skill, they got a bump in pay. And then if they were promoted to trainer, they taught somebody else how to do that skill, they got a bump in pay. And if they became a coordinator over a group of people, they got a bump in pay. So the idea is, is we take that worker that's skilled and we give them communication skills, coaching skills, teaming skills, and they move up on that pay system. And so we've always done that in industry is taking that person that shows that leadership ability to go on. But guess what? I don't want to wait for them to learn it. I'm going to teach it in the classroom as I'm teaching the craft trade. I'm just not calling it that because they're learning to coach and help others at the same time. That makes sense? So I would argue that yes, we can slow it down and include everybody, but include them in different capacities because now that person can coach, they can provide critiques, they can provide assistance, and I keep that person engaged. You know, for example, some of you in this room have been teaching for a long time, and I recognize that, and I'm going to ask for, through these presentations, for you to share some of your experiences with me. And if I do that, that allows them to stay engaged, because some of them say, man, I've been teaching as long or longer than this guy, what am I going to learn from him? But if I ask for their experience and get them engaged, all of a sudden they go, he knows talent when he sees it, he called on me. And all of a sudden they become engaged and they want to participate in the lesson because I'm not just blowing smoke at them and teaching them what they already know. We're having a conversation. They're learning just different. That makes sense, Veronica? Other notions or thoughts on this? I kind of felt like um, what you were describing was um, the three leg of the three legs of the stool approach. Where I'm going to talk about this, um, you're going to watch me do this, and then you're going to do this. Uh, one of the yeah. things that I found helpful. I mean, I, I feel like I was a teacher a long time before I was an instructor. Um, being spending that much time in the field, um, worked for the same company for almost 25 years. And I uh, had a lot of responsibility. And the biggest one was getting paid for the job. So um, I would watch people, how they were working. And with the, ex the experience that I felt, I had a, a great deal of experience. And I would coach people all the time, especially uh, somebody who was, and it, that's the younger people who are coachable. Um, and I would try, you know, if there was somebody else that was there, I, I took this technique into the classroom because I speak one language. I'm, I'm the dumb American and can only speak one language. Uh, we have a lot of Latinos. There's always somebody that can communicate in two languages. They, one of our instructors, is, that's how I noticed him. So we can always co-opt that other person to help. Exactly. <clears throat> And that's what we do. When we know there's experiences in the room, we call that out and share that with the rest of the group so there's learning because I know there's a whole lot more wisdom in the room than just me. A lot of us have experiences and we can share those. 
And so it's important to get those people engaged. And when we're talking about today's young people, this idea of breaking it down and simplifying, that's critically important to them. The other thing that's critically important is help them see relativity and purpose to what they're learning for the real world. Um, what are they going to do with this? Uh, one notion that I teach is this idea of, uh, you know, with latency, a good example of latency is most of us, if we ever took a class and the instructor was talking and we walked out of the class and we said, when am I ever going to use this stuff in real life? Now, for most people, that was probably a chemistry class, a math class, a history class, something like that. And they're thinking, when am I ever going to use it? I know specifically for me, that was when I was a high school junior. I was taking college algebra and we learned the Pythagorean theorem. And I thought, triangles, whoop de doo when am I ever going to use this? But then three weeks later, I was in a shop class and I was learning how to make a rafter. And they talked about rise, run, and pitch. And I go, whoa, that's a Pythagorean theorem. Now I know how to build the roof of a shed. And so, but it was three weeks later. But the thing is in industry, we don't have the luxury of people waiting three weeks before they get the idea. We're gonna learn it today because they're gonna go out to work this afternoon. They're gonna know it right now. And especially if we're talking safety, because if they don't learn it today, they don't go home tonight. So how do we teach it in a way to make sure everybody gets it? And that's just really what's made me thought about this wait and see thought is we just can't teach, keep teaching the way we have and teach the whole thing and not break it down simply for everybody to be on the same page from the get go. Anybody else, any thoughts or notions on this before we move on? I see we're at 202, we're halfway through today's presentation. Is there any other questions about micro learning? I do want to mention a conversation I had with a lady at the Carpenters Joint Apprenticeship Training Program in St. Louis, Missouri. We were having a conversation. I had just done a presentation kind of like this and talked about the notion of breaking it down step by step. And she said, you're slowing me down, Doc. Takes me forever to get through all the steps. And I said, let me ask you a question. You teach it your way and you got to redo it three times to make sure everybody in the room got it. I teach it once and everybody gets it the first time. Who's slow and who's down? A notion I want you to consider. It's never about the content or the time. Sometimes we get signed the course and we think we got 15 chapters. We got to cover the whole book. Do you? What if you only covered half of it and you made sure everybody got it instead of only half of them get the whole thing? Not about content, it's about student acquisition of the skill. That's what you and my job, that's all it's about. Putting people to work, gainful employment. How do they get the skill? And our job is that everybody that comes in gets it, at least from our point of view. Now there's, I admit, there's knuckleheads in the room that don't want to learn and that's okay. But I'm going to do everything I can in the meantime to make sure that they have the opportunity. It's just a thought. Okay, Nicole, move on. Now I'm going to touch on a touchy subject with some of the apprenticeship training programs. And this becomes immediately true with today's learner. And that is they are digital natives. They are connected. They are attached at the hip to this device, the phone. And I've seen uh, different apprenticeship programs where they have rules that phones are not allowed in class, or you must immediately turn them off, silence them, and put them away. I did a presentation on campus, and it was so funny because the instructor was trying to help me out. She collected all the phones from all the students and put them face down on the desk up in front. And while I'm speaking, those phones are going bzz, 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 dancing all over the desk. They were raising more racket noise on the desk than they would have in their individual pockets. So let me talk to you a little bit. Next slide, Nicole, about a presentation 
that I did in Houston, Texas at the IAPB. And I brought up this subject. So I started my presentation and I had a screwdriver in my hand. And while I was speaking to the group, I started banging the table. And I continued to bang the table for three solid minutes. Okay, if I'd done it for five, how many of you are getting irritating about me banging? Getting pretty obnoxious, right? So I asked the question, I said, how many of you want me to stop banging the screwdriver? And everybody raised their hand. So I said, should we make a rule that Dr. Johnson isn't allowed to bring his tools to class anymore because he annoys the heck out of everybody? Or instead, should I come up with a way to teach Dr. Johnson the right way to use the tools? So for example, the screwdriver and all my tools in my tuba, I have them with me all the time. But when I need to, like the screwdriver, screw something in, screw something out, loosen it up, I pull it out, I do it. And when I'm through, so I don't lose the screwdriver and I know where it is the next time, I put it back in my tuba. Well, what if we did the same thing with the phone? Because reality is, guys, the most important tool that people have aren't on that tool belt on the left. It's the one I have in my hand. More people use this every day than any other invention we have. They text, they cell phone, and you all use this almost every day as well. For example, if you got logistics and you got parts that need to come in or things need to come in, you're texting and find out where it's at. Or if you've got a schedule to meet and things to do, you look on your schedule in your calendar and you find out where it's at. When you're looking up parts or information, looking up steps, when you're looking up procedures and guidelines, you go to your phone. Y'all use it. So the question is, since workers in the trade use it every day, why would we not want our young, fresh apprentices to use this every day? What we're concerned about is they're going to spend more time on it and less time paying attention to you or listening to the lesson. Well, that's a pride thing. It's not a reality thing. What we ought to be working on instead is bring your phones to class because they're digital natives. They're going to bring your phones to class, but I'll tell you what. I want you to keep it silent, but we're going to use those throughout the class and when we do, you'll be allowed to pick them up and use them, but I only ask that you do it when we do that. And then I make sure to include that in every lesson. So for example, a quick and easy way is, let's say that we're teaching a class on safety. And to get their interest, we'll say, so how many billions of dollars were spent last year on workers' compensation claims last year and accidents in the industry. Well, of course, nobody in the room knows that immediately, but guess what? In about a five second Google, everybody in the room has the information. They pull it up and then we have a conversation about factual data rather than guesses and estimates. And we talk about billions of dollars spent. How could we stop that? And then we put our phones away and we have a conversation about the data that we just got from the smartest device in the room. Or let's say that we're going to have students do cost estimates. You've got them doing a bill of materials for a project that's coming up and you want them to calculate the estimates. Got the calculator right on phone, pull that phone out, do the calculator, do calculations and give us what you got. You're done with the calculations, you put the phone away. Point is just like that screwdriver, I'm gonna use it frequently, but I'm not using it all the time. I don't use my phone to hammer or screw, but I do get it to retrieve information. I do it to connect and touch. And so it makes sense to me. We teach them how to use it properly and then put it away. That's been our problem with technology in the classroom, not the fact they have it. We just haven't learned how to deal with it appropriately and use it as a learning tool instead of an obstacle to overcome. Talk to me, what do you think?
I have. I, I let them them. use the uh, the phones um, when I'm teaching the wall covering classes. Uh, I do the residential materials. We have to go over with the patterns and stuff. So a lot of them are pretty good in math, but not all of them are. And the moment I tell them that we're going to be doing a lot of math, they start complaining and they're saying that they're painters because they 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 really didn't like school. And that's when I let them know that they can use the, the phones to use the calculator and it makes it a little bit more bearable for them and me. Um, and, 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 and that way I can teach them how to estimate the length of the paper according to the repeat and how many rows they need to order depending of the room size and the width of the paper. So we do a lot of math and we really do use those calculators a lot. So um, obviously um, when we're doing the uh, residential papers, every day we're doing a little bit of math. Um, so I don't forbid them bringing the phones. They just have to limit the use of the phones. And you as an instructor help them know when they can and should use the phone and yeah. when they should put it away. Mm -hmm. I, I did a training session with IATSE one time and I had a camera. Uh, actually, he was the production coordinator for the film crew. And he was trying to teach a lesson. And uh, I finally got him focused on teaching F stops, you know, for lighting. So uh, if you're not familiar with camera, the F stop distance between you and the subject and the light and how it affects it. Well, he had a cool app on his phone that you bring that uh, app up and point it at your subject and it got you the f stop from every point in the room. And so used to, you would have to go and physically stand there and, and do it and you did it with your camera and set the, well, he could do it all in one touch on his phone. So everybody downloaded that and now we've got a dozen amateur photographers using the f stop app off the phone and figuring out lighting for their, but it was a cool thing, and he had everybody engaged using the phone in the lesson. Now, he started out with a hands-on tangible product where he had, okay, there's the actor. Here's the camera operator. Here's the shot. Now, how do I figure out my lighting? And he introduced it that way, and it was physical. It was tangible. But while we know that most folks in our craft are hands-on and want to learn by hands, he was also smart enough to realize that they're the digital age and they got this thing in their pocket. Man, they pulled that out. Everybody in the room's immediately engaged twofold because we're not only doing hands-on, we're getting to calculate, use a cool app on my phone and they're immediately engaged in the lesson. So it really drives the learning and allows them to participate when they maybe thought, eh, I'm not into that stuff, right? Excellent point. Thanks, Ron. Anybody else? We use it for uh, CPWR's ASCOM with the Wiser app, looking up uh, different characters of chemicals and stuff like that. Fantastic. Fantastic. I also use, uh, this, I have the students use their cell phones quite often, especially in uh, for OSHA training and then when we did the hands-on OSHA courses, they can look up the standards. We actually um, showed them how they actually have the OSHA manual right in their hip pocket. So the, the tool is uh, is very useful. Uh, at the, there's a, always a time and a place, but I, I would agree wholeheartedly with. Excellent. And I'm glad to see you guys doing that. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Have any of you found challenges in doing it. Yeah, we've had a challenge where we've got apprentices, you know, with COVID and the masks and everything, they wear the full on hoodie. Well, now they're wearing earbuds in their ear and they're paying attention to the music and whatever else, you know, catch them, you know, see them, they're bobbing their head and they're just got their foot going and tell they're tapping their feet to the music. So that's one of the things you got to watch out for because, I mean, the safety factor somebody not paying attention even if they're not using their phone they got the they can't hear that's uh one of the issues we've had lately you know frankly that's an excellent point and 
uh, an interesting concept with the hoodies and, and whatever and listening and the nonverbal cues of bebopping and dancing with their head is an easy sign of that. But uh, you're right. And I think an important lesson for us to teach on why that's not a good thing is because on site, if we've got our ears paying attention to other things, we're not hearing the dangers around us. We're not hearing instructions or call for assistance from our coworkers because we got the things blasted in our ears. So it's, I call all this, I loop all this into what I call professional development and behavioral development. Because we in the craft trades teaching, are we are doing two things. We teach them the skill, how to do it. But more importantly, we're teaching them how to be professions in the craft, how to move forward. Because we just don't want them to do the job. We want them to, like several of you, have been around for 41 years doing this stuff. You want to see that next generation come in and enjoy it and love it as much as you are and to take part in that craft. And there are certain behaviors that if you're going to continue to do it, you got to be healthy, you got to be safe, and you got to have the right work ethic. So while we're teaching the skills, it's just as important to teach that work ethic and professional behavior so you can go further in the craft trade. So that's an excellent point, Frankie. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Anybody else seen challenges? I, I think the the phones on the jobs you know the on the job site or or at school overall like like you said it's a it's a safety concern, but but any 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 type of behavior whether you, when you're learning, you you can't help but think if if well I mean I know this from the last all the years but if something's happening if somebody keeps going to their phone while you're teaching them in the class you can only reasonably believe that while they're at work they're they're probably listening to music or something like that and not getting the not getting the uh uh the message there either and and a quick way is to just send a progress report you know when you when you notice or or not even ask but just send a progress report and and kind of you know maybe maybe ask the the supervisor about you know how how attentive is the the apprentice at work you know but but anything like that you know if it happens at school it shadows at work too or reflects. And that's a good point, Juan. And I would hope that what we do is, if we really think about how we use these and teach these in class, that we can coach that behavior out of them so we don't have to do that report. So we have consistently in my class, yeah, they will let me bring my phone, but he doesn't let me look on the thing and hook up my earbuds to it during class. I have, I can use it, but then I have to put it away every time. If they learn that constantly and consistently in classes, then I think they begin to learn that on the, on the job site that, you know, I got to pay attention to my work and be a quality craftsman and not be dinking around doing other stuff, paying attention to other things on the phone. That's a great point, Juan. Anybody else? I think another challenge will be that they're always double checking um, if what you're telling them is true or not. Uh, I was help, helping one of the uh, one of the uh, journeymen teaching a um, star class, so most of the uh, students were journey people, and and he was talking, teaching the OSHA class, and few of the uh, uh, members were on their phones. There's uh, checking the information that he was giving them. And I mean, yeah. it's good if you're okay and you're right, but if you're not, then you're getting a complete different debate that can get ugly if for whatever reason you're giving them the wrong answer. Well, and in my, in my role at the university, one of the things I teach is professional presentation. Matter of fact, I wrote a book called Powerful Presentations That Connect that I use for my class. And I talk about this idea of trust, you know, and engagement. We talk about engaging our audience and building that level of trust. Well, it's kind of like if you remember in kindergarten cop, the kindergartners with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and they were running the hallway and stranger, and they're all going, stranger, stranger, danger, right? And so 
think about in the classroom. I walk in the classroom and I got this guy that's not connected or a lady that's not connected with me, hasn't developed that sense of trust. Or like in this case, the guy given misinformation and we're texting it and it's not always correct. My level of trust goes down significantly. And so I'm not just going to listen to you if half of what you're saying is not right. And so that we create our own mistrust, but we have to create that trust early on. And if they get that sense of trust, that fact checking goes away. But if we've already told them or demonstrated for them, well, it might be, it might not be, well, they're going to keep checking us from now. I had an interesting presentation at the Carpenters uh, million and a half square foot facility in Las Vegas. I was doing it for training directors. I had 150 people in the room. And when I got through, I had a guy on the back that said, Doc Johnson, you know what I'm impressed with? is that after this presentation, and it was on this subject here, use of technology and engaging learners and stuff, he said, out of 150 training directors in the room that are all used to being on that damn computer all the time, not one of them was on their computer for your whole hour. And I said, I want to correct you. We have one, and there was one guy on the front row, that guy never listened to me the whole time. He was typing on his computer do a report or whatever for the whole dang presentation. <laughs> so I had 149 out of half, 150 that were engaged. But uh, some of them, you're right. They're just constantly on the phone. And I think it just behooves us to keep trying, keep teaching, and keep people focused on these are good tools, but we don't use the same tool all the time. We have to learn to mix it up and use it appropriately. Okay, Nicole, next one. So, we said that one of the things of the, of the Gen Z is that they're competitive and independent. So, why not use that to our advantage? Next slide, please. So, this is an opportunity for that independence to make sure that in our homework and our practice assignments and our learning assignments, that we make it a balance between group work and individual performance. So as an individual, I've got to learn this skill on my own. But as we scaffold the learning and have them learn more, then I can put them in teams and do projects and they can divvy up the work. So worker one's doing this leg of the project, worker two does this one. And they're, so they're working independently on their own work, but as the overall project, they're working together. And so just the notion is to consider not always doing individual learning, but also have a balance for them so that they can do some group work sometime. That might be group discussions. That might be group projects where they have to do like a team and they do a project and they learn this together. So they're learning communication skills, they're learning collaborative skills, they're learning to work together as a unit independent upon each other. And so there's different ways that we can do the assignment. So if you've been one that's used to doing the same kind of assignment for every lesson you teach, you just might want to switch it up, especially for today's learner that's looking for some variety and looking for some balance between individuality and work balance and, and that sort of thing. So does that make sense? How many of you use group projects? Anybody got an example of group project work you have them do when you're teaching them? Well, sometimes, um, depending on the the setting, you know, a variety of things. Whether whether you bring a game, bring a game, or or I mean, I believe I believe in competition. Some people don't. I like I like the students to get competitive. But also where they where they played those roles, like you were saying, where when somebody is ahead of the game, 
and you see them kind of distracted or you pull them to the side. Sometimes it's a, it's a good exercise to run them through and do a, do a job site scenario and, and put that person as, you know, as the supervisor. And then at the end, you know, have everybody um, do like a, like a satisfaction survey at the end of the class, you know, so they know how they were doing. And then maybe the next person, the next chance we get, you know, we could get another person to do that and, and keep everybody involved. That's a great point. And Juan, I'll tell you, I'm a very competitive person. Uh, and I like competitions too. But one thing I've learned in industry is that maybe sometimes people are confused with the purpose of competition in the workplace. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the research in the literature, but like companies like to offer employee of the month type of work. They have learned that's the most demotivating thing you can do in a company. Because if you understand motivation, whatever motivates one person demotivates somebody else. And in employee of the month, it demotivates a lot of people because they're ticked off. He got the parking space. He got the plaque on the wall. She got this. Per Why the heck did he get it? Not me. Yada, yada, yada. I had a local friend of mine that they run a local a uh, telephone company, and they've been laying ground cables and fiber optics and stuff. And he had a tech team, and he wanted to inspire them. So he said, "I'll tell you what, guys. When you as tech staff have a chance to do an upsell, if you know what upsell means, that is, you're providing the customer a service, and then you've taken care of their need. Then you ask them if there are other services or other things that you can sell them or help them with. That's an upsell." So it's like a twofer. When you go to McDonald's, they ask you if you want to drink with half fries. That's an upsell. So he said, if you do that, then whoever gets the most upsells at the end of the month, I'll buy you one. He said that first month there were more complaints because the new guy said, well, he's experienced. He's been doing this a long time. He knows everybody. He's going to have a lot more upsells. And some of them saying, I'm a techie. I'm out working. When the heck am I going to be on the phone doing an upsell? I'm working. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's just negative. And so he said after the first month of all the complaints, he trashed it. And he did a different one. He said, I'll tell you what. As a team, if the team will improve upsells across the board and everybody participates, then and you meet the quota, I'll buy you lunch for that month. He had to buy lunch 11 months in a row because everybody was included. Because he's motivating the whole team, not just one person. Because one person motivated, the others are not. I learned that in the newspaper industry when I started as a kid 40 years ago. I worked in a circulation room and I was in certain papers. And a job came up and they said, I'll tell you what. We'll motive, we will promote one of you to this position. So I just worked like crazy. And there were 13 people around us. And the other 13 people said, started looking at each other saying, well, wait a minute. I'm not as good as he is. I'm not as good. I don't have a chance. We were making two bucks an hour. The promotion gave me five bucks an hour. Well, guess what? It motivated me, but everybody else in the room was demotivated. So they slowed the work because when you're making two bucks an hour, the only way to make more money is to go slower. <laughs> and they did. So it was a demotivator. So competition is good, but we have to understand its purpose and how to promote it within the company. True competition isn't between employees, it's between companies. So if I was to do a competitive training scenario, I would have the two teams be different companies working against each other so that they learn that on this team, we're not working to beat one of my team members down. I'm working to beat that other company on our product or quality or service and our sales. You just have to understand the use of competitiveness in the industry. Good stuff, Juan. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? Any of the thoughts on this notion of individual and teamwork in your assignments?
I just have one question, Dr. Johnson. Yes. Uh, when you have a group, and as we do, we got a lot of strong personalities in, uh, in OSHA 10s and 30s, OSHA 30s more so in other classes that I instruct. Uh, we do group training, but I always struggle with uh, all the know-it-alls in the class. Uh, should we put one at each table? And I, last year I had the idea that I'm going to put them all at the same table and see what happens when they put, put all the dogs in the pen and see the big ones fight, I guess. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, that's a good point. And there's been a lot of studies on group work. One of the things is to make sure you maximize or optimize the size of the group. And we found out that when we do team uh, training, probably the optimal size is about five or six. If we get more than that, then we got the dominate, dominating ones that control most of the discussion, do most of the talking. You have some in a room that are shy and quiet, don't want to talk anyway. And if I got more dominant people in a room, that just gives me more opportunity to stay shut up. <laughs> and I enjoy that. And so what you want to do is allow the interaction of everybody in the room. And so, A, optimize that size of the group. Second of all, you know, uh, typically doing random things. So for example, when I do workshops, sometimes you come in, especially when face-to-face, -face, you get your packet and there's a blue sticker, a red sticker, a red green sticker, whatever. And you just randomly go to those groups and you're within those groups. So we kind of maybe base, uh, I've tried to base it on, for example, when I do a train the trainer for IOXI, um, I don't put all of the riggers and all of the makeup artists at the same table. I want everybody learning cross-training and learning about the other aspects. One of my favorite situations was I had a carpenter learn how to curl hair from a hairstylist on Showtime. And it was cool. He said, if you tell anybody I did this, I'll kill you. I think you meant it. But the point was, was that uh, I have people cross-learning. So you try to get that mix at each table. Uh, but here's the next thing, Wayne, and this is important. So when you have a dominating person on the team, you have to make sure that you're moderating the team and checking in on them. So if you're overhearing or listening to them talk and one's just doing all the talking, then you can, as the instructor, kind of just nudge your way in a little bit and say, good stuff, but let's hear from some of the other people. And then you call the people out. You bring the people into that conversation. Uh, one of the teaching techniques when I teach face-to-face -face is a thing called the proximity approach that I use in classroom management, and it works wonderfully. I use proximity to shut people up and to get people talking. So proximity is, you know that in body language, we all have a safety zone of two to three feet. And so when I get within your zone, that makes you a little nervous. And so uh, what I do with the proximity approach is, so if I've got a guy at the front of the room that's the eager beaver, hand waver, wants to be in on everything, I will walk past them slightly and face the rest of the group. And with them to my back, I'll ask the question. So who can answer this? And he'll be raising it. Don't care. I'm not going to call on him. I'm calling on somebody else in the class. Or if i got somebody that's talking all the time, uh, talking to his neighbor, doing whatever, I will walk over by them and I'll get close. I won't touch them. I respect them, but I'm not going to look at them, but I'm looking at the rest of the audience. I continue to move around and talk, but I'm within that two foot zone. Most people, when I'm within two foot of them, standing over their shoulder, shut up. And guess what I want them to do? Shut up. So it worked perfectly. Now I walk away. He might start talking again. That's okay. I come back and I stay a little longer. After two or three times, they know what I'm doing, but everybody else in the room knows. And they know unless you want Dr. Johnson to come pay you a little visit, shut up. Okay. Now, the other thing is, is that I have some people just don't want to talk. Kind of like Antonella, you haven't said a word the whole time. Been very quiet and shy. So I got this little wallflower sitting in the back corner. 
But I want everybody to be engaged. So how do I do that? Well, I walk around the room. And so I will get close to Aunt Penella and I will ask her a question and we'll be within three feet and it's me and her right there. The reason she didn't want to answer the question when I was in front of the room is because everybody would hear her answer. And she might be wrong. She doesn't want to be wrong. But if I'm asking her the question here, it's just me and her and maybe the buddies she's sitting with anyway that are right there. So she's not going to have a problem. And when she answers me, if she is wrong, I'm going to coach her until she gets it right. And then when she's got it right, I walk back to the front of the room and I say, you know, Antonella, I don't think Michael heard you there on the other side of the room. Could you speak up and tell him what we just talked about? And you know you're right, so you speak up and you're speaking out in front of the entire class. So I, just by my proximity and movement in the room, mm -hmm. I have disengaged the loud learner and I've engaged the quiet learner. So I can use classroom management techniques to take care of everybody in the class. Now, since we're talking about best practices on virtual, mute button's a great thing. I don't have to worry about the loud talkers because we can't hear them. I don't have to listen to their phone ring and our mute button works. My difficulty is you're seeing today, I got 20 of you involved here in this class. And I think I've heard from Veronica numerous times. I've heard from one three or four times. I've heard from uh, Wayne a couple of times. The rest of you are kind of out there not giving a lot of input. So it's harder to engage in this. But you do it like I do. You stop every now and then, you ask the question, and give them an opportunity. And notice I even made Antonella smile a little bit when I picked on her about being that wallflower, and she got engaged all of a sudden. Engagement's critical. Go to the next slide, Nicole. We're wrapping up here, 23 minutes to go. So provide immediate feedback. They want immediate engagement and feedback as to go ahead to the next slide. You're on the right track. Let them know how to get better. They don't want to be crit criticized, but they want to know if they're in the right direction. They're very competitive. They want to get there quick, but they want to do it right. So what they want to hear from you is immediate feedback on, okay, I messed up. What do I got to do different? Help me. And if you can provide that feedback immediately, that will help them. They want to know that they're doing right and they want to get it done quick, but they need feedback along the way because the most frustrating thing is they keep messing up. Ah, I can't get it. Well, and if they're not getting feedback and they don't have to wait for you to get back to them, that's really frustrating. So immediate feedback, constantly and continuum. Think back to what we talked about, teaching step-by-step, -step, teaching the smaller components. That's why we have them do it and we give them feedback immediately after the step instead of at the end of the thing. They're getting feedback immediately as they progress forward. They're not waiting to hear it later. Uh, in education, we call that the, the formative assessment. We're doing it while they learn, formative assessment. Summative is the final project, the learning at the end. Did they get the whole idea? And so in learning, we have to do both formative assessment along the way, and we have to do summative assessment. Did you master the skill that I taught in that lesson? Okay, next slide there, Nicole. So, talked a lot today. We talked about millennials, and we talked about Generation Zs. We've talked about the fact that the younger people are connected to the hip of their digital technology and not going away. It's coming in the classroom, whether you like it or not. So one of the things we have to do is think about how to engage them. They are digital natives. They are also, they like to uh, do it in bite-sized chunks. And they like to work alone and in groups and provide feedback. So we've talked about several components. What questions do you have for me today? Let's have a conversation about what you got away. I don't, and I want to go through to fully engage here. And I'm going to start with my wallflower, Antonella. Antonella, what is your main takeaway from today's discussion? 
It gave me a lot of insight, especially doing online right now, a lot of online. It gave me a lot of insight on how to help my instructors perhaps engage a little bit better with the apprentices that are at home doing their online training. I'm not an instructor myself. I have, I think, three of my instructors online right now. Um, so hopefully it will allow us to better their knowledge before they come to do their practical in class. Okay, great. Any questions that you have? Anything no. I said that you thought, hmm, I wonder? Not at the moment. Uh, I'd like to get my instructor's knowledge as they're with, the, in, they're with the apprentices more than I am. I know that there's always an issue with the phones. As, you know, in Ontario, I know that there's law that we're not allowed to have cell phones out there. So to teach them to start using cell phones to find information, we try to stay away from, to engage in them, to engage them, unfortunately. But the instructors would probably better know if there are things that they would be able to use that tactic as everyone always has their cell phones out and you don't take them away. But perhaps when we get to them, we can find out how, what they think about it. Other well, than I'm... that, it's true. The engaging, like you said, as soon as you called upon me, you said my name, I was right in there. Yeah. And it kept me alert knowing that there was a possibility you may have called on me, even though I was quiet. I didn't say anything. I was listening, paying attention, but I kept to myself. And knowing that, yes, you, you tend to follow along a lot better. I tell my students in my classroom, you know, you think about it in the classroom, sometimes students will put their textbook up in front of their face. And it's like, duh, I know your name. I know where you are. You don't think I can't see you. <laughs> I am going to call on you mm. anyway. Uh, and, you know, guess what? With uh, other than Jesse, who is incognito, because instead of her name, it has FTSNE in front i that's why i had to guess who she was but other than her your names are right there so even if you have your screen blank i still can see your name so it's not like i can't find you let's go hear some some others here tim i can see you on my screen so i'll pick on you what you take away from today tim? uh really it made me think about the cell phone policies that we have and um you know, I was thinking, how would that work in a hands-on training environment? And also, um, people have already brought it up where, you know, if they're using it in the training facilities, you know, they're going to want to use it on the job. If they're abusing it in the training facility, they're going to abuse it on the job. Um, I did hear you say, you know, bad habits, and they're hard to break. Um I'm just having a hard time grasping the cell phone part um, because it's such a fine line between abuse and being useful. Yeah. I think I think the driver here is if we can get them to the point to immediately understand, I'm letting you bring the cell phone in, but you're not going to have it in your hand all the time. You're going to put it in your pocket. You're going to put it in your purse. You're going to put it in your tool belt and keep it there until we actually need it. And just getting the habit of keeping your hands free and keeping that thing put away until you need it. Once we can get them to the habit of doing that habitually in all of our training classes and everything they do, so they know I'm not touching the phone while I'm here, I'm putting it away until I need it. Uh, that's a critical factor. And then using it in ways that you would use it in the craft. Uh, I'm not trying to make you, force you to want to use the phone in your classroom, but I think there are definite times that you probably, you use it, whether it's checking logistics, checking schedules, checking safety standards, checking policies, checking whatever it might be, site requirements for a job, you may be using it then. Well, if that's something you use, then why not teach your students that? So, yes. Think about it, but I agree with you. It's tough to break in that habit, but I think attitudinal behavior is learned through observation. Uh, how do you teach somebody to be punctual? 
They turn their work in on all the time. They show up to class on time. It's an observed behavior. Well, use of telephone is an observed behavior. Do you have it out all the damn time or do you have it up only until I ask you to do it? And they get a grade for it because of going to work. Too many people grade only on technical skills, but guess what? Nobody gets fired because they don't know how to do the work. They get fired because of stupid stuff that they do with their attitude. Show up, wait, can't get along, use the phone all the time, make them mistakes. We have, we're we required to teach them those attitudes just as much as the technical skill. But you bring up a good point, uh, Tim. Thanks for sharing. Let's go to Matt Shepard. What's up, Mark? Hey, you know, this is a, this is a great subject for DC 14. Um, we uh, implemented this uh, distance learning back in March. Well, not of March last year, but we shut down in March last year due to COVID. Uh, we were left uh, kind of uh, scrambling, trying to come up with a plan to keep our apprentices engaged because we were no longer having them come to the school. So there was um, a lot of meetings, a lot of team meetings that we all went through uh, to come up with stuff. Uh, and we implemented the LMS uh, with Zoom training at night. Um, some people were doing different things, showing videos, um, doing Kahoot. Um, and just, just like you, we had every bit of 20 plus in each class at night. So the apprentices were able to uh, go to work and actually get 40 hours a week and still get their school credit. So uh, yeah, this is a, a good good course for people to take and uh, learn how to engage the apprentices. And uh, I think uh, everybody will benefit. We, we did it on the fly and uh, it actually turned out, uh, we kept the program going. The apprentices still continue to get school credit um, and uh, get their raises at the same time. So a lot of good stuff here. Um, some good points everybody that has been speaking here has brought up. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Michael, uh, go ahead, Michael. Hey, come on. <laughs> um, there's quite a quite a lot I got out of uh, got of this, and the phones is something that we've been going back and forth with for years. Um, and while we were talking, I, I looked up uh, some phone etiquette courses. Uh, maybe that's something that we have to hit them right off the bat with, because we just tell them no phones, or like Wayne said, okay, you can use it during class here and there. Um, maybe that's something that we need to. Uh, present a course. Um, the other thing, Mark, I wish that that you've taught this course to us um, months ago, if not a year ago, uh, because I don't think this is going to go away for us, uh, even after this pandemic. Uh, the members love it, um, and, and we just need to, um, uh, like you said, do short units, short digestible units. Some of our courses, especially the, the, uh, the bridge painters, they are, I mean, we have them on five days a week for five weeks in a row. And it's hell. Um, it definitely is. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what, uh, you know, I got out of this. And it's great. Well, I know what the trades have learned is, okay, before I had to pay Dr. Johnson, he had to fly here. I put up his hotel, his airfare, his room and board, his expenses. And then we had to sit through the training for a day or two days. Okay. Well, guess what? I come on Zoom. I go off. And it's a short two-hour burst today. And voila, you go back to work. And so I haven't ruined the whole weekend or the whole day. And everybody go back to work and doing things. And they're learning. We just saved like half the expense on doing this and we save time and people are more productive. So I absolutely agree with you, Michael, it's not going away. This may be the wave of the future and how we do things and increasing our productivity work and what we do and how we learn. So hang on, get ready, because it's going to stay with us. Thank you, Michael, being here with us today. Veronica, I'm going to ask you, you've been one of the more vocal ones. What was the main thing out of everything you got?
Well, I really like the whole class. Um, here at the school, we have the phone policy. Uh, we try to keep it to the minimum. Uh, I did talk to my uh, director of training. He knows that I do engage uh, them. Well, I want them to use the phone in some of my classes. And my classes are pretty hands-on. So I really have very few issues with them on their phones. Um, OSHA classes or, or classes that are more uh, in the class, um, they, they will be more of a problem and I can see why. Um, but I know I really like the idea of slowing down a little bit and make sure that everything's moving in the same page. So I'm gonna try to do that. Um, and no, I really enjoy your class. Thanks for being here, Veronica. Mm -hmm. uh, Frankie, I saw you come up next. Go ahead, Frankie. Yeah, I got, you know, the use of the cell phones with the, um, uh, trying to keep the lessons short, you know, especially if, you know, we have, if you're doing the death by PowerPoint, you've got a lot of slides to cover and things like that trying to get it more engaging because then it, they're, you're boring them to death and you know, keeping them focused. You know, if you go from 15 to 30 minutes, you know, talking and then you do a hands-on or you do something to break it up is very interesting being able to keep them more engaged and learning more. I mean, because I do realize, you know, most of our apprentices, I, I think I, I say that from Atlanta, we have a lot of uh, younger apprentices. Um, we do have some older uh, uh, apprentices in, in the trades, but keeping those younger ones, you know, now find a way to keeping them, pull out the cell phone, how to use it without actually, you know, reprimanding them for pulling it out, you know, cause that, that's another thing, you know, they, they want to Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, what all of, all the major stuff like that, keeping them off of that while, being engaged in class, you know, it is a challenge for everybody, but hopefully that we can, we can do better at that. Thank you, Frankie. And I'm glad you brought up the death by PowerPoint. If you notice, I have a mantra that I teach trainers. Bullets are for guns, not PowerPoint. And notice my slides today. Other than my takeaway slides, not a lot of bullets in the picture. In image or a caption, keep it simple. Because uh, people don't remember what they read, they remember what they see. And so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Jesse, oh, Jesse changed her name. I picked on her and she changed her name. Jesse, you're... Um, yeah, I love this. I'm happy to be here. Um, I am a millennial, so I will say that I support the short digestible units. Um, I think nowadays we have so much sensory overload, especially the younger generation. So we're constantly, constantly being bombarded with notifications and emails and text messages. So I think, um, yeah, as a society, our attention span is getting smaller and smaller. So um, I loved that. And really, I took like a whole page of notes and I'm, you inspired me to... Um, maybe send out either a weekly or a monthly thing to all of our instructors with like tips, you know, um, tips on how to engage your students more and uh, maybe even doing something like that for the students, ways to be an engaged student. Um, so I loved all this content and I'm looking forward to trying to um, share it with everyone. On your, on your notes or your uh, tips thing, I just went to a learning, a LinkedIn learning webinar, and they said one of the major things that companies are doing is every employee learns something every day, and they give like a two-minute snippet at the beginning. So every day you walk in, they're on your email is a snippet. They help you improve your work for that day. An inspirational point to think about what to do, how to do it better, how to engage better, et cetera. And so everybody's learning every day. And so that kind of notion that you're talking about providing feedback to instructors, keeping them going, giving them new ideas. My department chair at the university gives us a weekly newsletter. And in it, in 
in addition to the updates and what's going on, he's given us tips on things about how to deal with the COVID thing, how to deal with stress, how to deal with students that are offline, how to, de- you know, and so it's just information every week. We're getting bits of information. Great stuff. Good luck Thank with that. Thank you. Jessica. Yeah, I love that. And um, I know you said you have some YouTube videos as well. Um, yes. so, so, you know, that's another avenue I might take too. Um, yes. exploring your, your video content and, um, you know, all the other abundance of resources that are out there. So thank you for the inspiration and um, all of the teachings. You bet. Dan McDonald. I was just looking back at my notes there. The uh, digital natives is the one that caught my eye there. On, uh, you know, these are people that grew up around all this technology. So it's up to us as the instructor to work with them when it comes to that. Yeah. I learned that having millennials in my family, every time I got a new phone and didn't know how to operate it, they were the ones teaching me how to use it. So they're used to it. So our students are the same. So we just have to comprehend that and do that. Thank you a lot, Dan. Appreciate it. Steve. Uh, what? What I really took out of it uh, the most, um, I'm going to try and probably tie two things together here where you, you talked about the awareness of the class and how it's, how it's going and, and not letting people get lost, left behind, or, and not people get, that are ahead too far get lost ahead, for lack of a better term, um, and, and trying to take those people that are ahead of others and bring them into a coaching role and move them move them around and like it's something we we try and do here and there but sometimes it gets distracting and you get overwhelmed but to to lean on some of the the um, apprentices or even journeymen who who pick up the material faster than others and have them help uh, the ones that are struggling and now I'm going to tie that to the phone because we we do introduce the phone with a lot of different stuff and ironically enough it seems to reverse the roles when you get to that because the guys who are more mechanically inclined inclined and pick stuff up better in the class, for some reason, it's not always the case, but are less likely to be good with the technology. So the younger generation that maybe is not as good with their hands is real good with the technology and they end up helping the, the guys that have been around longer. Or it, it's, it's a very interesting way for a class to mesh and then kind of turn on itself to where everybody kind of works as a team. So that was something that was working in my head as you were saying a lot of that stuff. That makes great sense. That's good stuff. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Stuart. Yeah, well, I've had the pleasure of actually going to one of your workshops and getting to play little games and keeping myself distracted, but still retaining what I'm listening to. So it's uh, interesting to see how we're taking it into the future here and I myself, I let my apprentices use their phones on a regular basis. If you got the tool for the job, use it. It's as simple as an app on most things. I get students that range from the age of late 50s down to late teens. Teaching fractions in a group when you've got three different generations in there. I'll have somebody who needs four pieces of paper to do long division and somebody who opens a fractions calculator app and can do the entire book in three minutes. So teaching it and sharing it is good. Also like to utilize uh, Cahoots a lot to get that competition going. And right now, I've basically, because of this whole COVID thing, we've been doing a lot of home study for them online, using Google Classroom as my platform and using Cahoots, the LMS, and then just a lot of quizzes and assignments through the Google Classroom. Because I'll be honest, I'm lazy. I like it marking everything for me. Excellent. And a couple of you mentioned Cahoots. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. That's a quick phone app that you can have them uh, give a question and real quick they respond. And, and it's just a real quick and easy way. It's a good way to do um, what we would say closed ended observations or check for understanding. It takes about five seconds and it shows on your screen and it records what everybody did. and yes or no, right or wrong, and it's all anonymous, but it's there, and you can say, okay, 30% of my students didn't get it, or 
only 30 percent got it maybe i need to cover it again but it's a quick and easy way to use the phone technology as a game type thing in the learning so great suggestion for you guys that have used that good stuff to it and good to see you again which which presentation did you get to go to do you remember um it was two days in toronto yeah and uh I just, the main thing that floored me was when we walked in and you actually had toys on the table for us. Yes. <laughs> and that really that's opened my thing, eyes. That's one of the things that I might talk about next time in engaging the learner. In the class to classroom, one thing we learned a long time about the mind and how it works is that as long as the hands are active, the mind stays awake. So I had, I had uh, silly putty, I had uh, uh, little tiles of word tiles, like Scrabble tiles. I had uh, Swinkies. I had different manipulative things they could work with, uh, pens and doodle pads. And the thing is that two or three in the afternoon when most people are going, starting to nod off, if you've got these stuff going on, they're keeping active and they're staying awake the whole day. And it's uh, and he got to experience that in Toronto. That was my first IFEB training session that we did at the Cambridge Hotel there in Toronto. And that was a really cool experience. But yeah, I use toys. I have it. I'm going to have to ship all my participants their toys if you're going to have the same ones in Zoom. But I'll figure that one out. Thanks a lot, Stuart. Michael Moreski. Your thoughts for the day? That's pretty close on the pronunciation. Uh, first thing is, I want Jesse. Uh, I want to get her notes. <laughs> uh, so one of the the, I, I guess the uh, a takeaway for me would be that uh, um, the validation that um, somehow fell into the right path with. Um, a few years ago, I uh, got tired of fighting over the phone. So we do a scaffold class. You don't need to remember all this stuff, guys. You just need to know where to get the information. If it's your phone, go to your phone. I allowed that in the classroom as long as they weren't like, you know, Facebooking too much and all that crap. Um, you know, as long as it's pertained to the work we were doing. Uh, that's how you can find your standards. In the Boston area, the foreman on any job is gonna give all his direction to all his guys and girls over the phone. Are you done there? They send texts to each other. So that they know that they can't be taking, um, you know, union made pictures of their work and posting it on Facebook because everyone has access to that. So that was a validation in some, in some respects. The big thing for me is, um, in the classroom, whether it's a virtual classroom or a person, to reduce the size of the content without having any you know, in that interaction. I think we've been able to do that in Zoom. We have little quizzes, but I have this um, exam view uh, um, program where some of this stuff has to be a PowerPoint. We could uh, you know, we could add, there's a, a lot of times there's a test at the end. Uh, we can add those in as we go and have the, you know, break it up into a lot smaller pieces. So that's the takeaway that I'm going to try to work on. I appreciate that, Michael. And thank you. Your anniversary. Congratulations. Have fun. Thank you. you. Just means. Joe. Well. Thank you. Joe. Real quick, your thoughts for the day. Joe Tarakowski, are you there? So I looked up and wasn't unmuted. <clears throat> the space bar wasn't working. Okay. So your main takeaway of the day was what, Joe? Well, I like the different inputs on um, how to handle class. Because um, we do have a cell phone issue here in the school. And we tried doing the no cell phone rule in our school here. But then we try to utilize it with some of the training. So you kind of get that attitude about, oh, I could use it for this, or you get backlash. You got one guy saying, oh, you know, I don't want to waste my Wi Fi, my data, blah, blah, blah. And we got a guest Wi Fi. So just some ideas to be thrown out there, I think, is all helpful as well. 
Okay. Thank you, Joe. Lisa Brooks. Yes, um, what my takeaway is, um, well, being a part-time instructor and pretty recently started, I haven't had the issues. I'm sitting here more learning from the ones that have been on before, like Frankie, who've been doing it for years, but I can't see an issue with the phones coming from being just, uh, just being, coming on as a journey person and being a apprentice more recently. Um, going in with those tips of kind of helping use the cell phone as a tool, as a as a tool, as opposed to being a restrict being restricted from use, will probably be an easier route. And um, just um, having the knowledge of the micro learning and making lessons more short and digestible. Um, like I said, I, I, I'm a new instructor, but I am a mom of two during a pandemic. So some of these strategies I could actually probably practice with my kids at home because uh, my son is very engaged on the computer, but it's not in lessons, it's more so on Roblox and uh, those kinds of things. So maybe helping him to set a goal of setting lessons first in a short, shorter time, maybe that will help him stay engaged longer. So I can see the use for this in the future in class with apprentices and right now with my home situation. Excellent, good stuff. Robert Zappa, real quick. Yeah, how you doing? A uh, couple things I got out of it uh, kind of took me back. Uh, I think I was about a year on the job here and. I'd leave the classroom and my head feel like it want to explode and uh, had to learn how to treat each class differently. We have a new group of guys here every day and what works for one group of people definitely does not work for all and trying to come up with ways to, you know, teach different groups of students and, uh, you know, you kind of brought it up earlier. It's, it's kind of hard to talk on your cell phone when you're up on an extension ladder cutting in a wall or something. So yeah. try to keep them as busy as possible and uh, just know that each individual needs to be uh, addressed individually. That's all I got. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Robert. Juan. And Tom, I know we're going just a little bit over time here. So uh, if we can, we got two or four more to address, or how are we doing on time? I'm good with it as long as they are. Okay. Well, they seem to stay and engage here. I haven't had people run into the door yet, so. I, 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 I hate to be the, the elephant in the room, but I have a dog swimming at four, so when you see me sign off, uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you. So go ahead, Juan. Big takeaway today. Big takeaway from the day is, um, you know, having to one of the one of the reasons I took this course and the other courses I have in the last couple of weeks, it's it's, you know, been through a lot of learning curves um, with the online learning with the pandemic, also with the big shift in um, in the, in the generation of 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 apprentice, you know, finally starting to see a big majority in in a lot of the younger group coming in, so I, I got to up my game change some of the some of the tactics I, I really like the micro learning kind of kind of slowing things down um, I, I do notice across the board that that some things uh, hands-on skills aren't aren't uh, uh, they're not jumping on that I am happy about the other stuff though the like our online learning you know a lot more success with that with the newer generation coming in but um, I, I think I think anytime you know with that we sit down and, and give feedback and and, and have a, a class like this, it's, it's always it's, it's always great. And, and regarding, you know, the, the phones, b before this all happened, you know, I was completely like, you, you wanna pull your phone out? Then, you know, that's, that's actually a signal that you wanna go home. Um, but now uh, what we do is if, uh, 
if somebody's using it, uh, we try to say, oh, well, you're probably trying to uh, gain, uh, you're looking up something from the lesson. Why don't you look this up and try to draw them in to, to do that more? I, we're still kind of against, against the phone, but I try to use it more as a tool. And I notice that they put it away when I keep asking them to look stuff up related to the class. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for sharing. Peter, I haven't heard from you the whole time. Talk to me, buddy. Well, um, I got I got uh in-person class. I got that down pretty good. I've been doing it for a while. Um, I struggle on uh keeping the uh the attention of the students up on the Zoom. Um, I try to speak with my voice up and down, but you know, it's still a struggle. I mean, sometimes you, you, you can see the sleeping right on you, you know. And, um, but the, the short spurts class that you talked about, you know, I'll definitely be trying that on my next Zoom class and, and trying to keep them engaged. Um, phones, phew, you know, that's been a battle for many moons. And, uh, you know, I, I've given up on it. And I, I go with like just about what everybody else said. You know, I, I, I try and tell them, hey, I think Google is a great thing. And when I was an apprentice, I wish they had Google. I'd probably be a mechanic if I had Google when I was a kid, right? Um, you can learn anything you want. And uh, so it, it, it's a blessing. I think now uh, I, I now use it to be my friend. And, and that's pretty much what I got. So next time when we meet next month, the second gate, the second stage of this is engaging the learners in the online environment. Yep. So this idea of keeping them fully engaged and with me and not falling asleep and not getting bored, we're going to hit a lot of that next time. Because I'll be honest with you, Peter, I was a lot like you. I then face to face. I felt really comfortable with it. And now all of a sudden we got to do everything online. I had this happen to me just in the last two or three years. So our university started offering online courses and programs. And we started slowly having online students. Five years ago, 90% of my students were all face-to-face -face in my class. Right. This semester, I have 150 students and 130 of them are online. And so it has completely switched. And so I'm having to learn to get better uh, at teaching in the online environment. I've done it. I've been, and I've tried to get good at it but I've never thought I was as good as I was in the classroom, but that's just completely changing for me. So it's not a want to, it's a have to thing. And so I'm working hard to keep up with that and get more engaging in doing this type of thing. So, but we'll have a great conversation next time about engaging and getting people going. Thanks for being here with us today, Thank Peter. Thank you. Okay, got a, two, three more here to finish up with. Uh, Jonathan Plimpton. Hey, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I got a lot out of this. Um, my takeaway for today, a couple of things. I liked what you had said, um, you know, how you presented the cell phone using the screwdriver and tapping and how it can be a distraction, um, but also how it gets used properly, um, you know, which we can and do use uh, the phone in class. Um, it can be a great tool and, um, you know, it just helps things along. Uh, the other thing uh, is team motivation. Uh, I like what you had to say, you know, about uh, not individual motivation, but team motivation, um, because, you know, after all, whether you're in the field or you're training uh, as an instructor or um, as a district, um, it takes a team. So thank you. Thank you very much, John. Pleasure having you. Okay. Wayne? Excuse me. Yeah, I'm uh, actually, I feel good knowing that we've developed some good things over the years. Uh, you know, the cell phone used to be a big deal for me after coming out of the field. I've been teaching here for 18 years and we know what a detriment they are in the job. But uh, I usually say, listen, I know how you how you feel and uh, no one wants to keep you away from your family or anything important, things like that. So if you if you get a phone call or a text message, please kindly take it out of the room. Uh, 
and then it is a distraction. So you, you, you made a good point there. So using it correctly, I think, uh, is important. And I thought the screwdriver uh, exhibit, you know, the noise and the distraction was, was perfect. Um, competition, I've always believed in. As a foreman, general foreman in the glazing field for a long time, I think that a day goes by uh, very fast and guys are almost uh, sorry that the day's over because they're having a good time competing with each other. And it's, 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 it's fun and it's healthy, I think. Uh, I just want to add one more thing to uh, what we do in the uh, Zoom classes. When we do certification classes, we spread them out over a few nights. But we do a lot of questions. We do poll questions, little snap quizzes, things like that. And that promotes uh, student interaction. And I think we're we're looking for new ideas. Uh, a couple of our instructors are here with us, but I think having this, give the student an assignment, you know, maybe take some pictures on a job. What, what problems don't you have? Let's play stump the instructor, if you will. Uh, and then they'll get a chance to share their screen and, you know, everybody anticipating when their turn is. I think you made that point that everybody's gonna be at the ready. Nobody's gonna be sleeping. Uh, I took a lot away from this class and I, I really appreciate it. I can't wait for the next one. So thank you. Appreciate your input, Mike Pence. You were trying to get in a while ago, and we bumped you out. So, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, um, I went to your seminar in Toronto. I work with Stuart. So, basically, what Stuart said is basically what I, I'm thinking the same thing. Okay, great, and glad to see you again, Mike. Yeah. Were you in the group? If you remember, one of the teachers in there was the guy that ran their hospitality management he was a chef and had his group yep. make bread balls if That's you right. remember were you in that group i was a, with one of the members from that group yeah i remember that <laughs> that was cool because everybody got to take home a loaf of bread and you got to make that was cool awesome yep. good to see you mike yep, and then it's go ahead another last one here mr relevant so uh <laughs> Basically, what I took away from this, uh, Dr. Johnson, is, um, you know, we're not doing as much online, but I think everything that you laid out here today can be used for classroom instruction, too, which is what I really liked about it. That's probably the biggest takeaway. Um, the thing that I struggle with is the cell phone use. Um, I was born in 79, so I'm not a millennial, but I'm pretty close. Um, but I, uh, I look at the other building trades around the area here. And um, I'll take, for, for example, the carpenters. They are a hard, no cell phone rule. You can't even have it in the building. Now there is a ton of math in the, in the carpenters uh, trade and there's a ton of other things they could be looking up and they get through it. That's what I struggle with. We have computer labs, we have iPads, we have, multi, we have calculators, we have ways that we can give them. I think that we're coddling to them a little bit. Um, I think when you're bored and you already have that phone at the ready, you're going to the phone. If you don't have a phone in your pocket, you're going to a broom or you're asking a teacher how to help. So I, I still struggle with this. I think there's alternatives to not use the phones. I understand it. I'm kind of with uh, Mr. Wayne Daigle there where, hey, if you got a, an emergency, um, step out. I say no cell phones in the building. I tell these guys I want them so far down in their pockets, they're in their socks. So I don't want to see them. But if they got them and they got an emergency, use them. Um, you know, things like with Miss Veronica was saying, if, if you know, if it's 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 if it's dire, they need it. You know, for some kind, you know, they don't have a calculator, or it's inconvenient to go to the lab, and we'll make that exception. But I think the more and more we keep making exceptions, eventually these things are going to take over. So I'm still kind of on the fence with how how we're going to use these things in here. I, I like your idea, but I, I think a little bit more policing has to go on and. And then that that falls on the instructors. And if you got it, as the classes start to raise and, and go higher in numbers, you know, we're capping our classes at six, seven, eight, because we're live right now. They're going to go to 15, 20 again. And all these kids are going to have cell phones coming back. And I think that's a hard thing to monitor. So um, I, I wanted to take the hard and fast rule of no cell phones at all in the building. That's the easiest way to police it. But that lasted about two weeks. So, um, yeah, we got to start looking at some of these alternatives that you laid out for sure. And if you have more, um, we're, we're definitely open to them. And I, and I can appreciate your point, Dan. I certainly can. We've heard several of your fellow colleagues mention, though, other things than just using the calculator, for example. Uh, for example, looking up the OSHA standards or looking up 
my boss just sent me the requirements of what I'm supposed to do today. And so I look at that and I got my job list for today's instructions, and those type of things. Everything that is completely relevant to what they're going to do in the trade, I think that's a perfect opportunity to allow that to introduce that. And, you know, I struggle with the, as you said, catering to them. Part of this is, and I used to say this, and I, maybe I offended some people, but one of our problems as instructors was you were, we were afraid that they were spending more time looking at Facebook and, and TikTok and, and doing that at their phones and staying a pen, attention to me in the class. And I was bluntly honest. Sometimes, folks, it's because you're boring as hell. Anybody's going to look at the damn phone instead of pay attention to you. We got to do a better job as an instructor in the classroom so they're not wanting to go to it. Because if our teaching is forcing them to want to go elsewhere, that's not their problem. That's ours. So just a thought or a notion. So anyway, we are 20 minutes past the hour, and I apologize for that. But I wanted to get a good take on where you all thought we were on this. It sounds like everybody's got some good stuff they've taken away from it. I've challenged all of you, particularly with the phone. Everybody addressed the phone. That was not particularly my main point of the day, but it seemed like a main point everybody touched on. And I knew it would be because I know the industry is challenged with, what do we do with the new the digital natives and that damn phone? How are we gonna address it? Especially when we're online, because when they're in class, I can see them with the phone out. But for example, I got my phone out right now and you can't see it. So maybe I'm sitting here texting and playing on it and you can't see it. How do we do it in an online environment, engage that and do that? So by teaching, up and at them, use it when I need it. And then I want your hands free and we're doing other stuff. So there's some things that we can learn and we'll talk more about that in the engagement thing. So thank you very much all. I enjoyed having you all today. Tom, any last words? Yep, sure, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Johnson. And I, I was off for a little bit, but I will say something, one more thing about the telephone. I hope it's not a downer note, but I, when I first got into teaching, you know, all the, the school shootings. So all of a sudden you throw all the, the, all the kids' telephones in the front of the room and put them in a bag and all of a sudden something does happen. A true emergency does happen and the kids don't have that telephone. So I think, you know, that's, that, I've seen that a lot at school safety conferences. And, and just, again, I think what Danny said and what, what Mark or Dr. Johnson said, you know, teaching them, right? Teaching them the right use of that, of that tool and that. So I, I, always, I always think of that, um, uh, of that piece, what would happen in, in some, if something did happen from that perspective. That phone can become a real good tool. Nonetheless, um, again, thanks, uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, you know, we have, he has two more scheduled. Um, uh, one on engaging. I think the next one's engaging, and the third one is more on assessment. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I don't. It's not a prerequisite. You know, I think it's out. And Nicole can maybe talk more about that. We didn't. We don't want to tie them all together. But so hopefully we see you back on that. But maybe we have some of your other folks on as well. Some of your other instructors as well. And. Um, if, if this is something that you like, please let us know. And, um, you know, doc, these, are, these aren't the only things Dr. Johnson can do or that we can do. And I'm sure he has other topics, any other faculty members he can get us access to for these workshops. These workshops are great. Um, they're easy to put together. Um, and um, it's a great way for us to continue to learn and share, in particular, share those things like, like some folks have said, you know, share the, the, the strategies and that we're using in our, in our classroom. So. I want to thank Dr. Johnson again. We'll see you next week. Make sure you take the, the survey so you get credit. So you get credit for that. Or get credit for the class, please. We don't have to force you to force complete you. We don't like to force complete you. Um, and um, I'll turn that to, to Nicole for anything else. I forgot anything. Nope, I think we're good. Check out that survey. We'll, we'll stalk you behind the scenes, even though it's anonymous. We, we'll be able to figure out if you took it or not. Um, no, seriously, if you do have anything, any follow-up questions, concerns, certainly email us at FTI International. Make sure you take the survey, and then we'll see Dr. Johnson next month. Hope to see you all then. Everybody stay safe, and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.